Hello maths fans, Dr. Tom Crawford here at the University of Oxford and today we're looking at the maths of dinosaurs. Ah! This video is inspired by a recent trip I made to La Reina Dino Park, about one hour from Lisbon in Portugal, which is an open air museum that contains over 200 full-scale, scientifically accurate models of dinosaurs. And yes, that does mean the velociraptors have feathers. We'll be taking a closer look at some of my favourites, whilst of course doing some maths, but first I want to talk about speed. One of the first news stories that I covered during my time as a science journalist looked at the mechanism that determines an animal's top speed. In general, the larger the animal, the higher its top speed, up to a point. And this is where the science, and therefore the maths, gets really interesting. The science says that theoretically, a large animal like an elephant has a much higher top speed than that which we observe in the wild. It has bigger muscles, a longer stride, a better circulatory system, all of which mean it has the capacity to go much faster. But because of its larger size, it takes a very long time for it to reach this top speed, and in fact is limited by its acceleration. To directly quote the author of the original study, Miriam Hurt, animals have a limited amount of time to accelerate up to high speeds before they run out of the quickly available energy stored in muscle fibres called fast twitch fibres. So in other words, whilst the elephant has the tools to go faster, it can't get the energy to where it's needed quickly enough to actually reach that top speed. So what this all means, and this is where the maths comes in, is that there's a sweet spot when plotting speed versus size. So let's have a look at the graph. If we, on the y-axis, plot the top speed, and this is the actual top speed, not the theoretical one, actual top speed, and then on the x-axis, let's plot the mass of our animal, then if the animal is really small, then it doesn't have a very big top speed. So very, very small mass, like a mouse, has good acceleration, but its top speed is actually quite low. But then as the mass increases, so too does the top speed up to a point. So this is actually going to start to decline again once we get past this kind of sweet spot in the middle. So there is a turning point or a maximum of this function where very, very small animals with a small mass will biologically be limited and therefore have a small top speed. They have small muscles, small circulatory systems to pump the oxygen and the blood around their body. As you increase, that top speed goes higher and higher, as we're seeing here. And then, if you get too big, as we've just been discussing, and as was discussed in the publication, if you're too big, you never actually get enough energy quickly enough. You don't accelerate fast enough to get to that top speed. So your actual theoretical top speed continues to increase, but you can't reach it. So your actual top speed is gonna be a little bit lower once you go past this kind of perfect size animal. And we, being mathematicians, are of course interested in how do we determine the location of this sweet spot? How can we figure out the turning point of this graph? So we need a function, we need to differentiate it, and we need to use the tools of calculus to work out what is the ideal size, the ideal mass of animal to have the maximum top speed. For animals alive on Earth today, the fastest animal on land is, purposeful pause for you to all think of your own answer, a cheetah. As I'm sure many of you may have known or may have guessed. 
In fact, there is a specific cheetah called Sarah, who lives at Cincinnati Zoo, who is the official world record holder for fastest animal who clocked 61 miles per hour in 2012. Now, the mass of an adult cheetah is around 50 kilograms. There's obviously some variation, but approximately 50 kilograms is our number. And if you look at the figures from the publication, we can see that 50 kg, the cheetah, does fall into this sweet spot, this turning point on our graph. It's not particularly small, like a mouse or an insect, and it's not particularly large, like an elephant. It's right in that perfect sweet spot, the turning point of the function. But what does this function actually look like? Well, fortunately, the function is derived and given in the publication, and it's as follows. The top speed, v, is equal to a constant a times the mass of your animal to the power b. So this gives you that increase as m goes up, v is gonna go up, but then it's limited. We have to have this limiting behavior of being too big being a bad thing. So it's multiplied by one minus e, the exponential function to the power of minus h times m to the power i. So m here is the mass, so v is the top speed, that's what we want to work out. We know that it depends on m, which is going to be the mass. e is the exponential function, 2.718 is the one tattooed on my arm. And then the other variables are biological parameters, so a, b, h and i, those are parameters which are determined by the biological properties of the animal or the group of animals that we're considering. For land-based animals, those which run on land to achieve their top speed, just like the cheetah and the elephant and the mouse, the ones I've been talking about so far, and soon to be the dinosaurs, we will get there, I promise, for land-based running animals, the parameter values derived in the paper are the following. So A is 26, B is 0.26, H is 22, and I is minus 0.6. Now there are plus and minus some error on all of these, but these are the average, the mean values, which again are given in the paper, and I will link this in the video description so you can check all of this for yourself. Now if we plot this function, and I'm going to use the computer program Desmos to do this because it's much more accurate than my attempted sketches, if I plot this entire function using the given parameter values for a, b, h, and i, we get something that looks like this. Now, this does not look like the original curve that I drew on the board, and the reason for that is that here we have the sort of standard scale to the axes, they just count up. However, the shape curve that I drew on the board was actually according to a logarithmic scale. And this is a common practice in scientific papers and even in mathematical papers with experimental data when you're considering your data across a vast range of magnitudes, so from very small mice up to very large elephants, there is several orders of magnitude difference there in the mass. It's often a good idea to look at the data on a logarithmic scale, so putting logs on the axes. So if we now change the settings and change the axes to be on the logarithmic scale, we can very clearly now see the hump shape, we can see a clear peak, a clear maximum value, and now what we need to do is actually figure out at what point does this value occur. Now what does all of this have to do with dinosaurs? I promised you at the beginning that the theme of this video would be the maths of dinosaurs, but so far we've only been talking about the top speed of animals that currently live on Earth. However, the versatility of a mathematical model, which is precisely what we've got here with this formula and with this shape graph, 
The versatility of the mathematical model is that we can now use it to make predictions about other creatures. So, this model was derived using the biological parameters for land-based animals which run in order to achieve their top speed. So there's no reason why we cannot use the same formula and the same parameters to make predictions about the top speed of dinosaurs which were land-based and achieved their top speed by running. Now, of course, we do not know the actual top speed of any of the dinosaurs. We can only estimate based on their biology, but we can also estimate based on the maths using this formula. And all we need to do that is we need to know the mass of the particular land-based dinosaur. So we input the estimated mass of the dinosaur, and we have pretty accurate records of this based on the fossils. We use the parameter values derived for current animals living on Earth, which is a pretty good approximation. And then we substitute everything into the formula and we get a prediction of the top speed of that particular dinosaur. So, which do you think is going to be the fastest of the dinosaurs? Maybe it's Velociraptor. How about Spinosaurus? Or perhaps it's just good old Tyrannosaurus Rex. Get your guesses in now, because in the next part of the video, we're going to do the mathematical calculation to work out the speed of all of the dinosaurs. Now, one way we could do this is to take the estimated mass of each of the different dinosaur species, plug it into our formula using, again, the known values of our parameters, and get a prediction for their top speed. And I, in fact, have already done this. I have a table with various values for a whole host of different dinosaurs, but I'm not going to reveal that just yet. Because we can use maths, and in particular, the tools of calculus, to actually be a little bit cleverer in working out which dinosaur is going to have the highest top speed. So all we need to do to answer the question as to which is the fastest dinosaur is, in fact, work out the value of the mass which corresponds to the sweet spot of our function. And according to calculus, that means locating the x-coordinate of the turning point of our function. So how do we work out the location of the turning point of a function? We use calculus, we differentiate the function, and we equate the derivative equal to zero, which is exactly what we're going to do. From our formula, we can see that the top speed v is a function of the mass, and then we have these other constants a, b, h, and i. Now, it's important to remember that they are constants, but for now, I'm going to keep them as letters rather than substituting in these awful looking values. So, we have, writing it down here, v is equal to a times m to the b, 1 minus, I'm going to write this as exp e to the power of minus h m to the power i. So we want to work out the turning point with respect to m for mass. So that means we want to work out dv by dm and then solve that equal to zero to get the value for m. Okay, so differentiating. I'm going to have to use a product rule because we have this first term and then we have a second term in the bracket. So the product rule will tell me uh, a is a constant, bring down b, reduce the power by 1, and then multiply by whatever's left, leave the term in the bracket unchanged, and now swap the roles. So now plus the first term completely left alone, a m to the b, and now we differentiate in the bracket. So I've got a minus e to the something. So I have to differentiate the bit at the top of the exponential and bring it down. Um, so the minus is going to come down. It's going to remain as a plus. Uh, and then I'm going to be left with the derivative of this. So that's i h m reduce the power by 1. And then multiplied by the exponential. 
And again, the two minuses have cancelled out here. M to the power of i. Uh, okay. Again, we solve this equal to zero. So let's just put that over here. Now, we're going to need to rearrange this expression. Um, let's move the first term across to the other side. So change the sign. And the way I'm going to change the sign of it is just swap the order in that bracket. So I can say a, b, m to the b minus 1 times the exponential swapping the sign minus h m to the i uh, minus 1 is equal to a m to the b i h m to the i minus 1 multiplied by the same exponential term. Okay, now we can start crossing off some of these terms. So I'm going to get a different colour just to emphasise what's happening. So we can cancel the a on both sides. Again, assuming it's non-zero, we know it's non-zero. Um, we've also got an m to the power b. So I'm going to be careful. I'm going to cancel those, but I've still got a 1 over m. So it leaves me with a b over m times the exponential. And then what have I got? on the other side. So I've got a b over m, let's just write this out. b over m times the exponential minus 1 uh, is equal to, so the a's gone, the m's gone, and now I'm left with the i h. Let's write that as m to the i divided by m. So I'm taking the minus 1 power of m, putting that on the bottom, because then it's going to cancel with that one. Uh, and then, of course, the exponential term. H M to the I. So I can cancel those M's. And I think that's pretty much all I can do. So, no, there is one more thing I could do actually, which I think I will do, is if I multiply all three terms, so you've got two terms in this bracket and then this term. If I multiply everything by e to the positive H M I, that will just make all the powers positive, which I kind of like. So let's just do that. So I'll go back to blue. And I think what we can end up with here is the following. Uh, it will be a b, and then that will disappear, minus e to the hmi, which is now the positive power. And that's equal to, we've got, that's gone. So then we're left with an i, and then times, um, which I'm going to write in a bracket, hm to the i. Now the reason I have written this in a bracket is because it's i multiplying something, which is a combination of variables, and over here we've got e to that same combination of variables. So really, if I relabel that combination of variables, uh, so I'll write it first, so if I can write b minus e to the x equals i times x, and I just realized I forgot a b there. We're outside this bracket. Let's <laughs> add that one back in. So I think we can get down to that. And I've said here um, where x is equal to hm to the i. And then simplifying that finally, I can take the e to the x across, divide by the b, and I can say e to the x is equal to 1 minus i over b times x. And I think I'm going to leave it there for now, because what I've ended up with is an implicit function. Now, the reason I referred to this as an implicit function for our unknown x, and remember x, once we know x, we then figure out m, because h and i are known from up there. So x here is basically playing the role of the mass, the thing we want to solve for. Now, this is an implicitly defined function, and that's a problem because what it means is I cannot get x equals something. Because if I try and rearrange, I have an x, so I can rearrange, but then the other x is trapped in the exponential. 
So how do you remove something from an exponent? You take logs. But then if I take logs on this side, then I get log of x. So I, x has, instead of being trapped in the exponential, is then trapped in a log. So you can't simply rearrange to get x equals something. It's an implicitly defined function. So what we do instead is we think of these as two separate functions. You have a function on the left and you have a separate function on the right. And our equation is satisfied when these two separate functions are equal to one another. So what we can do, and what I am going to do over here, is plot these two functions. Because the left hand one is just e to the x. We know what that looks like. That's just, that's your e to the x function. And the right hand one is actually just a linear function of x. So it starts at one, and then it would appear to have a negative gradient. However, i over here is negative. And that's an important thing to spot when you're considering plotting these functions. So i is negative, b is positive, so what we've got is 1 plus a positive number times x, so that's a positive linear gradient. So that one starts here and then goes up like this and is going to cross our exponential at some point here. And this is going to be our magic number. This is going to be the sweet spot. This is the solution to making our derivative zero. This is the coordinate of that turning point of that sweet spot. So this function here, just to be complete, is 1 minus i over bx, where again, I'm just going to make a note i is negative because we know its value over there, which is why we have a positive slanting linear. It's meant to be a straight line, a nice straight linear function. Plotting these functions using the values for i and b from the paper, we get the following graphs. Note the same shape as the ones I've drawn on the board. And we can actually solve these and we get an answer. Their intersection occurs when x is equal to 1.491. Now remember, x has been redefined as h times m to the i. So what this means, going over here, is x is equal to 1.491, which is equal to h times m to the i. So we substitute in those values and we get 22 times m, which is unknown to the power of minus 0.6 has to be equal to 1.491. And this, of course, we can solve on a calculator. And this gives us the sweet spot m is equal to 89 kilograms. So this means, according to our model here for the top speed of a land-based animal that is running, the ideal mass, the sweet spot for the weight of that animal is 89 kilograms. So, do any of our dinosaurs have a mass around 89 kilograms? And the winner is Deinonychus, which you probably didn't get because <laughs> it's not one of the more famous dinosaurs. Deinonychus is, however, very closely related to Velociraptor. It is also a type of raptor, slightly larger than its more famous cousin, with a mass of around 55 kilograms, which according to our formula and our model, predicts a top speed of around 63 kilometers per hour, making it the fastest of all of the dinosaurs that are at the Lorenia Dino Park. Here you can see the full list for all of the dinosaurs that I have computed the top speed for using our model. This, of course, is not exhaustive. There are many more dinosaurs out there, and I do recommend that you have a go yourself, look up the mass of the dinosaur, and see if you can use the formula to work out what its top speed would be. Some others that I'd just like to draw your attention to, mainly because they're my favorites, or I've mentioned them earlier in the video, we have the Velociraptor, the cousin of the winning dinosaur, uh, which is a little smaller 
as I say, so the Velociraptor has a predicted top speed of around 54 kilometers per hour. Big Daddy T-Rex, one of the most famous, if not the most famous dinosaur, much, much larger and therefore on the downward trend side of the curve. So the T-Rex has a top speed of around 28 kilometers per hour. Spinosaurus, another one I mentioned and also made famous from Jurassic Park, that has a slightly smaller top speed than the T-Rex at 27 kilometers per hour. Triceratops, with its three horns, very, very large creature, has a predicted top speed of 24 kilometers per hour. And Stegosaurus, with its cool spikes going down its back, has a predicted top speed of 32 kilometers per hour. And finally, the giant herbivore dinosaurs in the Diplodocus family, which also includes things like Supersaurus. These are, of course, huge, huge creatures, so they're going to be very far down that tail. And they are, in fact, some of the slowest dinosaurs that I found on my list, with a top speed predicted of around 20 kilometers per hour. Now, you may have noticed that all of the dinosaurs we've looked at so far have been based on the land. They achieve their top speed by running. And the reason for that is the model, the formula that we were using to calculate those top speeds came from the biological parameters or the biological data for current animals living on Earth that achieve their top speed by running on the land. But what about animals or dinosaurs that achieve their top speed by flying or by swimming? What about the dinosaurs that lived in the sea and the sky? Now, fortunately, the scientists behind the original paper did also work out the biological parameters for the same model, the same equation, but different values of the biological parameters for animals that live in the sky, achieve their top speed by flying, and animals that live in the sea, and achieve their top speed by swimming. And these are the parameters. So what this means is just as we did for the land-based dinosaurs, we can take this equation, use these parameters, the biological parameters for flying creatures and for swimming creatures, and we can again predict or use our calculus to estimate the perfect mass of the creature that we expect to have the highest speed. Now, I have already done this for you, and what we are expecting here is in the ocean, we want something with a mass of approximately 100 kilos, and in the sky, we're looking for something with a mass of around two kilograms. So the fastest creature in the ocean, the fastest dinosaur in the ocean, we would have expected to have a mass of around 100 kilograms. And the fastest dinosaur in the sky, we would expect to have a mass of around two kilograms. Now I leave this as a challenge to all of you as the viewers. Let me know in the comments, send me an email, write to me on social media. Can you find a flying dinosaur with a mass of two kilograms? And can you find a dinosaur that lived in the ocean or the sea with a mass of 100 kilograms? And once you've found that dinosaur, can you then also use the formula and work out what we would expect its top speed to be? So there you have it, the maths of dinosaurs. Thank you as always for watching. Please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed this. And I hopefully, if I can get out of this belly of this dinosaur, we'll see you all very soon. Take care. Can you come and let me pet you? Okay. Good dino. Good dino. Good dino.